We're going to be in James, and we're going to continue there in chapter 1. So I encourage you, if you haven't turned to James, uh, go ahead and turn there now. And stand with me as we pray before we get in the Word. God, we just thank you for your Word. We thank you for the truth that are contained in these pages. But we thank you that you are the Word. And so we um, ask you, the living Word, who dwells within us, to speak to us, to make us look more like you. May we be wrapped up into worshiping you through the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are in light of that. Thank you for being our help, our comfort, our guide, our Savior, our everything. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. James chapter 1, one of the uh, most practical chapters in the Bible that is one that I, um, I, I love. And people are looking for, like, what, what do I do in life? Like, James is a, a great book to look at. What, what do we do? But the problem with James is that it's often misread. And so it's very easy for us to turn to James and begin to think, okay, God did his part. Jesus hung on the cross. Now it's my turn. James is not about it's my turn. James is about how to remain in relationship, and it's about how to grow in the Lord. But sometimes, because of its language and because of um, the way we translate certain things in the English, there's certain meanings that English carries that the Greek didn't really say, but we didn't really have a great way to capture it. And so our, our translation's good, but sometimes with the English, we, we tend to get uh, different ideas a little bit. And so my, my goal through this is to really give us what was it that God's trying to say through James and, and get to the heart of it so we're not confused, we don't turn into works. Because James is not about works in any way, though it's been a book that has puzzled people for quite some time because of some of these reasons. And so last week um, and the week before, we started... Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, he says. And the reality is, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, is it says trials of many kinds. There's all kinds of trials. I don't know what trial you are in, but most likely you're in a trial because it could be a small thing. It could be a big thing. It could be something in between. He says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Why? Well, he tells us, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so you may be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. Why do we have trials in life? And why do we consider it pure joy? We consider it pure joy because of the outcome. The trial's not fun. The trial's not good. No one's saying the trial's good. It's the outcome. Consider your pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you'll be made mature, complete, and not lacking anything. But the word before that is we have to persevere. Now, the, the thing is, this is where many people can, can go wrong and start to go down a works road is that word persevere because what we read and what we think is a trial comes, it's now my job to buck up and make my way through it. I have to muster up the strength to get through it. So the trial comes, I need to persevere, and if I do muster through it, then I'll be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. However, this is not what James is saying. That might be a great English way of looking at it, but it's a terrible Greek way of looking at it. Uh, the word there for, for persevere means to, and is translated in other places, abide. It's actually, you, you'll see it, it's, it's the word abide you find in John 15. It's also, um, it, you'll, you may not recognize it because it's a, a compound word in the Greek. So it's, it's the word for abide is like meno or something like that. Um, but then upo is what's before it. So persevere is upo meno. So upo means to place under. For, and and it's, it's like abide, to place under in relationship. So what he's telling us, is to stay in relationship with God through the trial. Stay connected to Him, and then He will carry you through to make you mature, complete, and not lacking anything. It's not about mustering it up. It's about abiding in the Lord through the whole thing. 
Because what does he want to mature? What does he want to make complete? What does he want to supply if it's lacking? Himself. See, if I become mature, or you become mature, or as we are maturing, I should say better, as we're maturing, what's happening is we are beginning to look more and more like Jesus. And so what happens is he begins to make us look more like him through that because what happens is if you hold on to me, I'm going to show you how I can get you through this. If you hold on to me, I'll show you how we're going to get through this together. We have a high priest, Hebrews says, who has been tempted in every way and yet was without sin. Hebrews also tells us he is the author and perfecter of our faith. So Jesus didn't come here just to come hang up on a cross and die. He was also coming here, and here to show us as a man, what does it look like to be in relationship with the Father, to have such a close relationship with the Father, to um, have that communion with the Father, to know that that's what our faith really is. And what it's really saying is trials are opportunities to us to commune with God in the way Jesus communed with the Father. That's what we hold on to. And that's what makes us mature, complete, and not lacking anything. That's from the last couple weeks. There's more. You can catch it online. This week, we're going to start reading in verse 13. Now, one of the things about James that I think sometimes gets us a little bit off is that many times people see James as uh, segmented uh, sections that really are unrelated. They're completely related. And when we see them as unrelated, we, we tend to read these things. And, and if there's, I mean, I, I've harped on this a lot. You've got your little um, subheadings in there and bold and all that kind of stuff. And often that will screw up most letters because it's written as one thing, it's, they all connect. James really messes it up with the editing stuff because it's editor's notes, that's not how James was written. Some editor came in and, and put these things in there. And it's what helps us to begin to think like James is segmented. James is not segmented at all. Um, verse 13 says this, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of all he created. My dear brothers... Take note of this. Every one of you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. I want to show you how this section is completely related to what we've already studied one of my goals this morning. Because in order to understand what James is saying, we've got to understand how it's connected. They're not segmented. And I'm going to show you there, there's a couple things here that get segmented in our minds and oftentimes in how we teach things. And so we, we've got a wrong understanding. It, it may be a right understanding. It may still apply. I'm not saying it doesn't apply in the way it's taught. But we may have missed the richness of what God's actually trying to say to us. Case in point. Very often, people will turn to verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We take that. It's the verse we've memorized. It's the verse that we, we um, turn to when someone's angry and say, hey, look, you've got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. However, well, that may be true in relationship, and that may be true in, in how we relate to one another, and there can be some wisdom in that. He's actually saying something different here in context. So my goal is to show you this context because this is how we walk out of works-based faith and stay connected to persevering and abiding in the Lord. So here's how I'm going to uh, try and show this. Some of the stuff is going to be on the screen because it's going to be easier to fly through some stuff that way. Okay. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. We've already read it, but I'm going to highlight this to you. Consider pure joy, which we've already gone over, right? No, notice this, perseverance makes you mature, complete, and not lacking anything. We're going to focus on that word mature. 
complete, not lacking. It is a byproduct, right? So in James chapter 1, starting in verses 2 through 4, it's telling us that there's something that's supposed to be happening, which is maturing. It, it's, it's growing us. It's got that idea. Now, what I want us to see is, um, notice the language of growth and maturing, even in the section on temptation. Because it's there. So James 1 says mature. Now, now watch for the language. Maybe, maybe I was smart to put this on there. I'll see. Yeah. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. See the similar language? He has not changed subjects. He's trying to show you the other side of the coin. It's about maturing. So let's talk about this for a second. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because perseverance must finish its work, so we may mature, complete, and not lack anything. When we abide in the Lord, we're going to become more like Him. Temptation's the other side of the coin. So on one hand, you've got the Lord who is in our lives and encouraging us to hold on to him and stay in relation with him. On the other side, you've got an enemy who's trying to drag you away and take you away, and he's saying, hey, why don't you mature in my ways? There's your difference. God is trying to mature us into who he is and what he looks like, and Satan is trying to mature us into the ways of the world and the way he wants us to go. It's the same thing. It's just the other side of the coin. So what happens is consider it pure joy when trials come because... God is present, persevere in him. Now, the interesting thing is, if you don't see this in the, in the English, the word trial and the word temptation is the same Greek word. Different side of the coin. It's the exact same Greek word. And so what happens is, this is why James has to go on and tell you, look, God is not tempting you. Now, that's somewhat different. See, God does not tempt us God frees us. God does not tempt us. God invites us to walk into who he made us to be. What happens is, is that this, this moment can come, and what happens in the midst of that trial, there is this rub going, what's going to happen in my life, and how am I going to respond to this? So when trials come, consider it pure joy, because God is present. Stay close to him. He'll make you mature, complete, and not lacking anything. But in that moment of trial, there is also temptation within the midst of the trial. And what that temptation is trying to get us to do is say, who is going to be your comfort right now? Who is going to be your provider right now? Who is going to be your wisdom right now? Who is going to be the source of strength for you right now? Will it be the Lord? See, persevere in that. Or will it be something different? See, God does not tempt us. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away and enticed by their own evil desire. And so what happens is we got this desire within us that's evil is, is what's happened. And within that desire, what happens is someone comes along to tempt us and is trying to convince us this is the way to go. And it's going to try and drag us away. It's going to give birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it will, it will give birth to death. This is, this is what's trying to happen. Okay, now... Um, before you get hung up on, on too many of these things, keep it a little general. Um, what happens with temptation? The, the, the Greek word here is, a te is temptation is a um, hunting term, actually, in the Greek. It's hunting. I, if you may have been around when I've shared this analogy before. I, I had the, the thrill of going uh, crabbing. Um, and when I say crabbing, I mean, all, the only thing for me was the uh, hunt, so to speak, because I'm allergic to fish and, and shellfish. I don't eat it at all. But my friends wanted to go crabbing. They wanted to have a crab feast and all that. And I was happy to go along. And so because I'm not a, a guy who can eat fish, I, I've never done this before. So I thought it was really strange when we showed up with chicken necks and string. See, this is how you crab. I, I had no idea. What you do is you take a chicken neck and you tie some string around it and you take the chicken neck and you throw it out there. You don't have to throw it very far. It's just like five or ten feet. And what happens is crabs like chicken necks. I don't know who discovered this, but <laughs> I hate to be the first chicken that found that out. But at any rate, what happens is all you have to do to catch a crab is, is you take the chicken neck and the crab will just start to pinch on it. And while it's pinching on it, here's all you got to do. 
this is it. And every time you move it a little bit closer, you're like, oh, I want that. I want that. It's being dragged away from the place it was in. Slowly, in a way it doesn't realize and doesn't recognize, doesn't realize it's in danger, has no idea, and slowly but surely, it's dragged away. Scooped up and put in a boiling pot. What is it that the enemy wants to do to us? He knows the things that will entice us. And he'll throw something out there and say, hey, can you grab onto that? And he will slowly but surely try to drag us away. What is he dragging us away from? And this is the key. See, we think about sin as behavior. I don't think God really looks at sin as behavior. He looks at it about relationship and trust. And so what's happening is, is we're being enticed to trust someone else when Jesus is saying, trust me. Trust me. Now, the thing is, why does it give this analogy of conceived, birth, full grown? I mean, think about this in the sense like, when I've been tempted, I wasn't really knee deep in it. I was just like, well, that's interesting. Dabble a little bit here, dabble a little bit there. And before you know it, I have no idea how I got here. I mean, sometimes we just get so blindsided, we get stuck in a sin pattern. Like, well, how did I even get here? Like, it would start a long time ago. Just a little thing here, a little thing there. And what happened was I was letting go of some trust of the Lord in certain things. And so really what, what's happening here is what will you trust? Now, now think again back to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Perseverance must finish its work, so we may ensure complete and not lack anything. Next verse. If anyone lacks. So in one sense, he said, I'm going to put in you the things that you're lacking. However, if there's something that you're lacking that you recognize, and it's wisdom, just ask for it. Because the trial's not going to give you wisdom. I'll give you wisdom through the trial. But the trial will put my character in you. The trial will put, it'll strengthen my relationship with you. The trial will do those things. But if you're lacking wisdom, just ask for it. If you ask for wisdom, he will give it, and he'll give it generously without finding fault. So it means it doesn't matter if you've been living in sin or not. He doesn't really care if the whole reason you're in problem right now, maybe your trial is self-inflicted. It doesn't matter. He's like, look, if, if you need help, just ask me. I do not care why you're here. I'll help you out. Just ask. But when you ask, what do you have to do? You have to believe. It says you have to believe what he's, the wisdom he's given and not doubt. Because if you doubt, you are like a wave of the sea blown this way and that, and you're unstable in everything that you do. And so what he's saying is this, is that if you're lacking wisdom, ask him and then hold on to that wisdom all the way through. If you hold that wisdom all the way through, and you hold on to the relationship with the Lord all the way through, you're going to be fine. Relationship. See, no temptation, this is how 1 Corinthians puts it, no temptation has seized you, except that was common to man. So look, maybe you got tempted by sin. Well, you're not the only one. I'm in that camp, and everybody in this room is too, whether they want to admit it or not, but I definitely am. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. Notice it doesn't say this, but Rick's faithful. See, I think so many times we change the word of Scripture in our minds. We, we know what it says, but in our, the way we live our lives is different than what it actually says. It says God's faithful. It doesn't say I'm faithful. It says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So God has already determined you can bear that. There's nothing coming your way or my way that God hasn't already said. Yeah, they can handle that one. Now, why would God allow that? Because it's like, they're already mature, or I will be maturing them through this process anyway. They can handle it because I'm the one who's going to handle it. Remember that. Persevere. Persevere is about abiding. Abiding. God's faithfulness and God's strength is what gets us through it, not mine, right? He will not let you be tempted by what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. So God, according to James, is not tempting us, but he is providing the way out. 
So anytime a temptation comes, the question should be there that asks God, where's the way out? He is always providing a way out. It's always there. The question is, are we looking for it? Now, if we're honest, sometimes we like our sin too much and we don't want the way out. I like to call, I mean, my term for that is pet sense. The things we really like and like, ah, the way out's there, but I ain't taking it because honestly, if I was really honest, <laughs> I'd rather enjoy that and I'd rather not go that way. It's okay. God who began a good work and he will be faithful to complete it and he'll continue to work on us and he'll continue to mature us and what he'll do is he'll go, oh, well, you know what, that's a pretty immature decision, Rick, to, to say you, you don't want to go that way and you want to keep going down that sin, so well, we're going to mature you. He's not saying, how could you? Why did you? I'm going to beat you up. He's like, no, I guess we got we to gotta mature you. And so he does. God is not tempting me or you. He's providing a way out. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. We talked about this a second ago. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously without finding fault. It'll be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe, not doubt, because the one who doubts like a way of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded. Now, if you were to turn to James chapter 4, you'll find out that double-minded appears again in chapter 4. And when it says double-minded in chapter 4, you, you understand that this double-minded here is basically choosing between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of Satan. That's all it's really saying. Which one are you going to pick? So the key here is that you've got to hold on to it. We talked about that a little bit last week, but what happens is this. Let's talk about some wisdom that God might give, and let's talk about why we might give it up. Because what happens is when temptation comes... What is really happening is, do you want to believe the Lord and the wisdom of the Lord, or do you want to let go of it and choose something different? So I'm just going to pick some Proverbs. So no, no specific examples, just some Proverbs, and if it relates, it relates, but I'm not, I'm not hunting for anything. But just, I'm making no statements. I'm not trying to correct anything. Proverbs 25, 14 says this, Like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of gifts never given. It's an interesting proverb. You've got to think about the word picture here in order to get it. Like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of gifts never given. So here's our picture, clouds and wind without rain. What you have to do with a proverb, you have to think about what the picture is, and you've got to sink into the picture a bit, feel the picture a bit, and then you can understand the proverb. Here's our picture. Winds and clouds and no rain. You ever seen that happen? See, when winds come and clouds come and you're outside and you're outside playing, and all of a sudden and that starts happening, it's getting a little breezy and the clouds start getting a little dark, what do you think? It's going to rain. Have you ever left being outside to go inside thinking it was going to rain and it didn't? Yeah. I, I remember as a child, this, this still sticks with me. The forecast came and said that it was going to be pouring rain all day long and my family had planned a trip with my friends to go to the King's Dominion. I absolutely love roller coasters. And it was just like disheartening going. It's supposed to rain. Who wants to go stand in line for rides that won't even work because it's raining? Well, we just decided we're going to go anyway and just risk it. It didn't rain. What would we have missed? Oh, the, the thrill of my life of these roller coasters that I would have missed out on that. And you know what else happened? All the other jokers didn't go. So there were no lines, and I got to ride them again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And I'm thinking about all these other people who didn't get to ride it even once because it's supposed to rain. See, like clouds and wind without rain is one of boasts of gifts never given. So what happens is the wind and the clouds are boasting, saying it's going to rain. And see how people change their lives based on the boast? See the things that, that affect people because of the boast? Well, here's what it's saying is, if you tell someone you're going to do something, do it. Don't be like that. Don't be someone who says you're going to do something and don't. Don't say, be someone who says you're going to give something and don't. Don't say you're going to give your time and you don't. Don't say you're going to give your presence and you don't. Don't get, say you're going to give whatever it is and don't. That's the picture. Okay, here's some wisdom from God. How is it that we give up on it? Well, what happens is we, we say something when it seemed convenient to us, and then something changed. 
You're like, oh. And you've probably had this happen. You know, you said you were going to go hang out with a friend, and then the friend you really wanted to hang out with called you. But I mean, that didn't happen anyway. <laughs> Dilemma. Do you continue to hang out with the friend you said you would, or do you now come up with a reason not to hang out with them because you can go hang out with the other person and hope they don't even find out? Or it's like, you get my point. I don't have to belabor it. You get my point, right? So we can change because circumstances changed. Here's Proverbs 12:11. Here's the wisdom of God. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. If you work and you are consistent at working, general law, you're going to be okay and you're going to be taken care of. It's all of the stuff that you see late night TV that's going to tell you like, hey, do this, you'll get rich quick. Those schemes are all over the place. It, it's all the different things that are out there. And what happens is, you know, like the wisdom of God is just work hard and he'll provide for you. <laughs> There's these other people who say, oh, you can just do this and you'll be rich like instantly. You know, it does work out for some people. There's a reason why it's enticing. But generally speaking, most people are broke doing it, and a few people got rich doing it. But the problem is that the enticement is, hey, just do this. And what is really happening is that, that Satan's trying to get us to become lazy instead of be um, faithful. Now, why would we, we do that? Why would we change directions of God's wisdom? Because maybe our circumstances are like, I just need more money. I got to do this. I got myself in a hole. I got to do this. Also, maybe it's, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Or we have a desire of things we want. And so like, I'll never get that with doing it this way. Maybe it's that. And so do you see how it can shift and so it can change? Proverbs 11.25 says this. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I mean, the wisdom of God is to say, be generous. Can you ever see a time when you're like, oh, I don't know if I really want to be generous right now. Well, yeah, I mean, there's all times we start to see um, things in our lives as scarcity instead of a resource. And we start to see something as a scarcity instead of a resource, and it's like, i got to hold on to it. Did God's word change? Is God a provider? Does God say be generous? Is God generous? Are we more like him if we're generous? Can we trust him to be generous? These are just questions I have. Proverbs 3.27 says, don't withhold good from those whom it's due. When it's your power to act. Very similar to the other one, but it's like, if you've got the power to do something, don't withhold it. That's the wisdom of God. But the temptation's going to be, no, you need to hold on to your stuff. Okay, now what does that have to do with our, our passage here in James? Well, obviously, you know, the, the passage there about if you ask God for wisdom, hold on to it. And I'm trying to show that, you know, sometimes our wisdom, we let go of it. Well, I want to show you how James, in the section I read, is connected. James 1, 19 through 21 says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Oh, wait, sorry. We're going to get to that one. I didn't put the verse up I want us to see. Verse 16 and 17. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Who does not change like shifting shadows. Think about that picture, shifting shadows. You've got a shadow. Why do you have a shadow? Because the light's coming in, and the light is, is coming in, and it's hitting this object, and then there's a shadow behind it. What's a shifting shadow? When the light's moving, and the shadow changes because the light's moving, Right? It creates a, a shadow that's shifting. Your sh shadow could be short, could be long, could be go over here, could be over there. Like when the light moves, the shadow will shift. What is this saying about God? God is not a shifting shadow, and His wisdom is not a shifting shadow. And what God says, hold on to it because it's not going to change. Now the thing is, what happens? Why do we let go of God's wisdom? Circumstances change. God doesn't. Circumstances are shifting. God isn't. Circumstances are shifting, but God's ways are not. Hold on. Do you see how this whole section is connected? Now, let me show you that part that you've got probably got a subdivider in your Bible. Mine says uh, listening and doing messes the whole thing up. Because catch this, this isn't a passage just about anger. This is a passage that says this, in context. 
my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. Humbly accept the word planted in you. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. What's he saying? Don't be angry when God's wisdom comes against the wisdom of the enemy. And don't become angry when God is correcting us with the wisdom that we, we need. Listen to his wisdom. Be slow to speak. I mean, don't speak, to God, speak back to God and say, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Oh, this will happen. No, be quick to listen. Receive what God's saying. Receive his wisdom and hold on to it. And if you do, you're going to walk in the way. What's going to happen is you'll produce righteousness. But if you let go of it, the reason we, often we let go is because we're angry about wanting to change our life. Maybe someone else is getting away with it. Maybe someone's doing something and there's no problems in their lives and they're benefiting from this ungodly advice. Don't be angry. Humbly accept and say your word is true and I'll hold on to it. This is the context. Now can it apply the way we've applied it in other settings? Sure, it can apply. But know the context is relationship and abiding. That's what it is. There's more I want to share with you, but not today. Other than to summarize in this fashion, and we'll have to build on this next week. What, what happens is, in the trial, as I said earlier, the question is, who's going to be your comforter? Who's going to be my comforter? Who's going to be my provider? Who's going to be my helper? Who's going to be my wisdom? Who's going to be the one who loves me? Who's the one I'm going to respond and love back towards? It's relationship. Who? And as we answer that question, we become more righteous or we become more ungodly because godliness comes from relationship, not performance. I'm going to hold on and say, you're my provider. That's what I'm holding on to. And I thought no better way to solidify what's happening here than through communion. Again, we're going to do communion without music, without anything to try and create a mood. We're going to let the Word of God create that mood that's already created. I'm going to guide us through it. So I'm going to invite you. There's uh, communion cups over here, communion cups over there. Again, with COVID, it's all the, the prepackaged stuff. So if you're a believer in Jesus, you've placed your faith in Jesus, we um, invite you to celebrate um, Jesus' work in our lives. So I just invite you to go grab one and bring it back to you. Here's what we're celebrating. It's that God is the one who gives us new birth. It's God that is the one who uh, makes us like him. It's God that is the one who is faithful to complete the work in us. And it's God who started working in us and we're faithful to complete it. And so what I want us to do is take the bread. Jesus at supper I took the bread and he broke it. So take it and break it. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. And what happens is, you don't have to break yourself. We're already broken. And so he, the whole one, came and broke himself for us. What we're celebrating is, the whole one broke himself for us. So that we can be made whole. So partake of the bread when the body is broken. Say thank you to the Lord. If you hit peel back the next layer. The body was broken and the blood was poured out. But what's it poured out for? And what's the body broken for? Relationship. As we partake of the body and the blood of the Lord, we're remembering the relationship. We're remembering that it's the relationship that we're persevering in. It's the relationship we're abiding in. 
It's the relationship we're holding on to. It's the relationship that even when we find it hard to hold on to, he holds on to us. It's the relationship that says, I will make you um, like me. And so with it, just take it in a way of saying, I'm persevering in you. I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to the one laid hold of me. Have your way in me. Partake of the blood. I invite you to rise to your feet. God, we just want to thank you for being in our lives. Thank you that in trials we're not without. We're not without you. You're with us in every one. You carry us even when we don't know it. We thank you that you have wisdom that we don't have. And we cry out to you asking for wisdom in all of our trials. Would you give us the things that are from you to carry us through and to hold on to, but we also just hold on to you. We ask you, God, to be our provider. But more than that, we declare you are our provider. We declare you're our comfort, you're our shield, you're our protector, you're our wisdom, you're our peace, you're our salvation, you're our rock, you're the beginning and the end. You're everything. Help us to sink further into relationship with you. We humbly, humbly accept you as our Lord and Savior. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, it's easy. It's not anything to do with so to recognize that Jesus did it all for you. And to say, I'm a sinner, but I need you. And so we just invite you, if you want, to begin a relationship with God, to begin to persevere in him and abide in him. Just say, hey, God, I know I'm a sinner and I need you. And I invite you into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying my penalty. I love that you love me first and I love you back. I invite you to live within me. The Bible says that God will dwell within you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen.